Hi and welcome to episode two of Two Pints of Maggots and a Packet of Hooks, the fishing podcast. My name's Dave and you're going to join me going through the tackle shed, looking at the press pack and having a big chat with our special guest this week. Um, first of all, I want to say a big, big thank you for all the positive thoughts and comments um, and for those that have liked and shared episode one. Um, as I mentioned on episode one, it's a brand new project for me. Um, you never really know how these things are going to pan out. And if it's not down to you guys having a listen and showing your support, then there's absolutely no point in me doing this whatsoever. So what have we got lined up in this episode? Well, we're going to talk through the press pack. Um, for those that are unfamiliar, the press pack is where we take a look at the recent news in the angling press and also across social media we'll look at any interesting features in the monthly magazines uh, anything we've seen across uh, youtube as well um, we'll also go to the tackle shed where we'll take a look at some of the latest reviews and tackle uh, bits of information across the press and anything that i've seen that may be of interest also of course we've got the big chat and on this episode we're going to be talking to the legend the legend that is tommy pickering um after we managed to get over a few technical issues we really got stuck into uh, talking about all sorts of things and and the main things uh, i wanted to get out of tommy was all about the international scene you know what was it like representing your country um what was it like sort of pulling on those three lions and of course the manage your country as well so loads and loads of great things that tom came out with so i hope you're going to enjoy that I think what we'll do is we will kick off with the press pack. Okay, so taking a look through um, Angling Times, we'll kick off with the with the weekly magazine first of all. Um, and February the second, there's a couple of things that caught my eye. Uh, the first one was the reopening of um, a stretch of river on the Warwickshire Avon called Twyford Farm, and Angling Times gives it the dubs it the the Wembley of angling. And I, I, as with with the the theme of these podcasts, as you know, I sort of hark back to the good old days, if you like. And I always remember this stretch of, of Twyford Farm. Um, being on lots of videos, lots of records. I remember Jan Porter on there doing a, a feature on fishing for chub and, and some big matches on there, the Shakespeare super team and, and people like that. Um, well, it's quite interesting because it says here, and I'll quote from, from the magazine itself, it says, um, a return to the glory days looks on the card. Manor Angling Limited took control of the stretch and unveiled exciting plans for the future. So apparently the, the, um, the previous owners of the stretch ripped out all the pegs, Band fishing and it's all become sort of overgrown i guess and so you can imagine that the fish would have thrived on neglect i'm sure um it says here it carries on to say that the company's boss howard k has said matches and festivals for the next river season starting on june the 16th are already selling out we've got a river fest qualifier booked in too we'll be also opening a new tackle shop on site digging a teaching pool at the bottom uh, of the stretch for juniors uh, it's going to be a great venue, big chub, barbell roach, dace and bream. I'll start building the pegs now. We may even have a few ready for the start um, of the new season. So I found that fascinating because uh, it'd be really interesting to see what a river fest, a qualifier will be like on a stretch of water that's been pretty much untouched for, for a number of years. Now, directly below that article as well was a, a, a really interesting story, which I think is great news for everybody. Now, it talks about tackle giant Angling Direct. And, and I know uh, there's a lot of people I know that will knock Angling Direct because of almost like the monopolization of, of sort of the tackle game, I guess. But in this instance, uh, you, si you simply can't knock this concept. So... Angling Direct has revealed ambitious plan to train 80 members of staff to become a professional angling coach and work in the company's stores around the country, offering free advice to anybody who enters. Now, how can you knock that? That is going to be a great concept where um, non-anglers would be able to speak to somebody in a professional capacity, if you like, and really give them the ideas of, of you know, how to start and how to grow. It's a win-win for Angling Direct, of course, because they're going to sell more tackle out the back of it. But it's a win-win for everybody because this should drive um, more people um, into giving Angling a try as well. A couple of quotes in here as well. Uh, the initiative, which will see the retailer partner with Angling Trust, is geared towards catering for the new wave of anglers who have entered the sport last year. Uh, in a few months' time, there will be an Angling Trust level one coach in each of our 38 stores, which will add more of a community feel. We'll be training staff across the brand 
um, to continue. So it, it's a, for me, it's a brilliant concept. For somebody that is in my professional life, a trainer, um, I think the personal development of the staff in the store, it would be great for them, but also it would be great for, uh, for, for the Joe public as well and, and making sure that they're getting the correct gear to catch fish. And that's so important. If there's anything that really, really frustrates me uh, the most is um, the likes of your supermarket chains. A couple of times of the year, um, they stick a bit of tackle on them in the middle aisle, if you like, and, and it's just not fit for purpose. You know, the buying team of those those uh, supermarket stores really should be ashamed of themselves because, um, you know, they've got lead shot in there and all sorts of stuff. So I think getting good knowledge from your local tackle shop, you just can't buy that. And uh, it's more power to, to, to anglers direct to get involved. I did see some negativity out the back of it. Um, I saw a couple of posts on social media saying it was elitist and it's why are the Angling Trust supporting only the big stores? And, and that's not the case. Then the Angling Trust have come out and said, you know, anybody can join this initiative. You just need to get in touch with them and uh, and they can support you where they can. So I would say that to any local tackle shop um, worried about the monopolization of, of the industry by these big stores mm. is, you know, the support is there from the Angling Trust for you guys as well. Um, okay, up with the next uh, article I saw in the Angling Times. A week later, um, it talks about a British record eyed. Um, now, the submission's gone in to the Record Fish Committee for uh, verification. But what I found fascinating about this story is a chap called uh, Colin Hebb. Um, is believed to be landed Britain's largest eyed at clunking £8.6. Ounce. Is that it's from a river, but it's not a river you would initially think of. It's from the River Hull. Um, it's quite interesting. He goes on to say that in 2013, he was tipped off about an area on the river that held big roach. When he went to have a little walk and see, all he could see on the surface were huge, huge eyed. Um, so he's been targeting them ever since. So I think that's really interesting. I don't know how they got in there. I don't know how they, they grow so big, but what you've got to remember, I guess, I'd be in a, a sort of Scandinavian fish. They're, they're used to living in rivers, used to living in flowing water. Good luck to him. Hopefully that record uh, passes. That would beat the record, uh, previous record by an ounce. Mm. Next up as well, a, a brilliant story in um, in the Angling Times again, and, and it's, it's a news exclusive and the, the headline states, fishing prescribed on the NHS. Now, Fantastic stuff, along with the, the the coaching that we just spoke about um, with the Angling Trust concept. This is all about um, GPs turn to restorative effects of, of angling in drive to reduce growing mental health issues. So it states that the angling set to be prescribed by doctors on the NHS to help combat mental health problems. It's a significant endorsement of the sport's life-changing qualities, which will begin with a trial scheme in the Southwest. Under the pilot, which will begin uh, referring patients uh, this summer, GPs at seven surgeries will prescribe fishing to those with conditions such as depression and anxiety. And angling is now seen as... Um, part of the green prescribing solution, which links countryside pursuits with restorative effects. I won't go into reading the rest of the article. You know, if you see it, uh, I'll pick up the magazine, have a read yourself. But it, again, it's just a great sort of advert um, to the to the general public once again of the benefits of angling. And I've said all along, you know, that the matches that I fish are fantastic. You know. Um, the, the competitive side is brilliant, but just getting out and about and lounging around in the countryside, it, it's just that just does it for me as well, you know. And, and you just can't beat it that solitude, the relaxation. You know, it can be stressful when you're not catching and, and whatnot, but that's the competitive side. But um, I think in general, if for, for somebody that's, that's sort of suffering for those types of effects, fishing definitely will help. Um, and the, the last one, I guess, um, on February 9th was. Um, on page 13, there's a picture there of uh, Mr. Rob Hughes, a fine catch of roach for Carp King Rob Hughes. And what it says, he's got quite a good dozen or so roach, well over a pound, over up to two pound, where he's been targeting different venues on short sessions with his son, um, where he's done fly fishing for pike, uh, bread feeder, um, stick float with maggots, lots and lots of different fishing, gudging, um, you know, throughout the winter to try and mix things up during this lockdown. So more play to him. And I can exclusively reveal at this moment in time now that Mr. Rob Hughes, uh, England Carp Team Manager, will be our next guest on episode three during the big chat. So I'm really looking forward to, to chatting to Rob about his broadcasting career and about the carp side of the sport as well. 
Okay, so moving on then to the monthly magazines, uh, Improve Your Course Fishing. There's an article uh, with Des Ship on page 64. This is brilliant because this is exactly what I'm doing at the moment. And essentially, it's a, it's a lovely piece on preparing your gear. Uh, we're coming sort of out of the um, the cold, I guess, into spring. It's, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a little bit of spring in the air. And now's the perfect time, whilst we are still in lockdown and we can't travel per se, to sort of go through your gear, get everything nice and tidy and start switching from that sort of winter to spring mode. You know, just up in your up glance a little bit more, maybe a diameter or two, maybe just sort of, you know, putting on a, a slightly bigger hook and, you know, feed a little bit more and we can start thinking about introducing more bait soon, which is great. Um, and Des covers it all perfectly, you know, and, and I'm actually going through the whole process myself, getting a good old clean, ready for... Uh, for a spring assault page 78 as well of uh, improve your course fishing is a really really good interview here with uh, the ceo of the angling trust uh, jamie cook uh, now this is the guy that's not even been in the job for for a year yet for 12 months and and i guess has done more in these 12 months for for, for angling than you know we've seen publicly for a long long time um it's a really good interview lots of questions about his history his background and and whatnot but there was one question that really sort of stood out for me and, and i'll quote from the magazine it says uh, we've seen a lot of newcomers and returners to the sport this year due to covid19 do you think more people are starting to realize how beneficial angling can be in terms of physical and mental well-being now that leads perfectly on from what I've just said about the article in, in the Angling Times, the fact that fishing is potentially going to be prescribed uh, on the NHS as a way of overcoming anxiety and, and mental health issues. And, and then it's posed to the Angling Trust CEO as well. It's, it's, it's obvious, isn't it? You know, it's all coming a full circle and, and people are starting to recognise the benefits. And he, he, he talks, again, I won't read his answer, but he talks about how, you know, the likes of Paul Whitehouse and, and Bob Mortimer you know, with their health issues and, and, you know, how big their program became on TV because it related to the, to your average Joe, if you like. And, um, and, and when they're chatting to each other in their series, um, it talks about the sort of the health benefits that they've got from fishing uh, during the recovery of, of their heart problems, etc. So, and he talks about all this. It's a really, really good interview. I found it fascinating and it's, it's, it's a really high profile job. I think if it wasn't for him and his team and, and Martin Salter with his links to, uh, to Westminster, then we would be sat in lockdown as well um, without, uh, you know, getting out fishing. So moving on to Match Fishing Magazine. And the first article that stood out, or the first feature, should I say, is Tom Scully, page eight, straight into the magazine. Um, he's fishing Bloodworm. Now, for me, oh God, I cast my mind back. Probably 20 years ago, I learned to fish Bloodworm, a place called Pillsworth. Uh, Pillsworth Fisher up in the northwest and it's it's one of those sort of daunting tasks you think you see all these little live wriggly things in pieces of paper and you think well what do i do here now i guess i can't even remember the last time i fished it because i wouldn't even know where to start to get supply um i think the last time i checked out trying to get hold of some it was coming in from eastern europe and um, a lot of it was frozen so even getting live bloodworm and joke was a challenge. Um, loads of venues, pretty much all venues seem to ban it. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I see why it's not a popular sort of way of fishing here now. But I think back to those days on pills, whether you broke the ice, whether there was snow on the ground, you know, you'd put a bit of ground bait in with some joke, a fish to bloodworm over the top and you, you know, you'd get bites pretty instantly and you'd fish it out. You'd have that initial burst and it, you, your skill then came in to try and continue those bites after you'd sort of uh, plundered those initial fish. And, and in this uh, feature that Tom does, it's a, he's got a lovely net of skimmers and a bonus tench there. He talks about, you know, his initial feed and it's a really, really good article. You know, he's looking at sort of 30 pound of, of silvers, really. It's at Holcroft, a uh, Holcroft fishery. Um, and it's just a lovely read because it's, it's just not something that, you know, we get to do enough nowadays. And it's a, it's a massively important skill um, international wise. It's a big thing abroad. And it's a shame that so many places you know ban it over here and, and that the supply seems to have dropped off so if anybody knows where i could get a bloodworm supply from or you know i'd love to to have a fish again um with bloodworm somewhere where it's allowed and uh yeah give me a shout definitely 
Okay, moving from Tom on page eight then to page 82 in Match Fishing Magazine. There's an article here, the chap called Keith Easton, and he's fishing the waggler. Now, any of you that follow my, my Facebook page um, at Eastwood Angling or whether you've been watching any of the videos for Teddy Fisher, you'll see a couple of times now I've fished the waggler through the, through the winter time. So it's a brilliant technique. I fished it on the Winter League series as well before that got stopped and had a relatively bit of success fishing that. I, I just love it. it, it I think it's because it takes me back to, to the way I learned to fish. You know, I, I started fishing when I was eight. Um, I got a pole when I was about perhaps 11 or 12, a little eight meter job. So for those first few years, you know, where, you, where you're beginning to understand your watercraft, you're beginning to understand how to cast, if you like. It was all rod and line work, and, and I still love it now. And, and this is a great feature because he's, um, he's, he's fishing not a million miles from me. He's up in North Lincolnshire on uh, Messingham Sands. And he's fishing a waggler. He talks about how he, he sort of loads his own waggler with a bit of solder wire. And um, he fishes a micro pellets. So he's fishing, sorry, expander pellets uh, on the waggler with a sort of um, a crushed expander type mix. And, and that's quite interesting because it's, I usually always fish with, you know, maggots, casters, sweet corn in the winter time, but he's fishing with a, a soft expander pellet. Um, and he ends up with a lovely net of fish, mixture of soft skimmers, roach, crusions, F1s. So there's food for thought. Um, I always think, you know, casting out when you're hooking your expanders directly on is always a bit of a challenge. I always think you'd have to sort of hair rig or whatever, but now he's, you know, he's using a, a reasonable size hook, size 14. That'll make sure that it stays on, I guess. But yeah, it's a, it's a nice little article. And uh, for me, waggler fishing, just brilliant. I intend to actually continue this, uh, my little love affair through the summer as well. Final thing to sort of point out, I guess, on the uh, press pack is uh, a new website. So I've been fishing a few times down here with the uh, legendary angler's mail columnist, uh, Dave Costa. Now, Dave wrote an article in the Angler's Mail before it, it finished at the end of last year in 2020 for over 30 years. And uh, I bumped into him by accident when I was out and about um, a venue down here called Woodland Waters. We got chatting, you know, like you do. And, and um, we, you know, sort of got on pretty instantly, really. And, and he was telling about his future projects that he's working on since the magazine folded. And uh, the one that he's uh, spending a lot of time on is now starting to come to fruition. It's an old website that's being reinvigorated. It's got new owners and it's called fishingmagic.com. And Dave will be one of the principal writers and journalist uh, contributors, should I say, to the website, but also John Bailey. And John Bailey is very, very well known in obviously the, the specimen world, if you like. But um, a little known fact as well, if you check the credits on Gone Fishing with Paul Whitehouse and, and Bob Mortimer, John Bailey is the consultant on there. So he's the chap that's obviously going to be scoping out all the pegs that they fish, making sure they're going on the right stretches of river, making sure they maximize their chances to, to get some fish caught for the camera, I guess. So some really interesting articles that are starting on fishingmagic.com. Uh, check it out um, because they're looking to to grow it into big things. So that is the press pack. And uh, we're now going to move on to the big chat. Teddy Fisher Baits specialize in the manufacture of fishing ground bait and additives. We combine a 40-year-old proven fish catching recipe and the experience of our skilled team. Fishing is an adventure and here at Teddy Fisher we strive to make that adventure a success. Go to www.teddyfisher.co.uk to see our full range of baits. Okay, welcome to this episode's Big Chat. And I'm going to kick off the Big Chat with a roll of honour. So my next guest was the 1989 world freshwater champion. He's managed the England feeder team to two goals and one individual goal. He's also led the England ladies team to three individual and three team goals and was once the holder of the world five-hour match record. I'm sure there's many, many more that he could mention, but it's Mr. Tommy Pickering. How are we, sir? I'm great, mate. Thanks very much for that. I'll send you money for that, all the, for that introduction. Very nice. Thank you. Only a tenner and a bag of few capellets. Not bad, eh? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> all right look we've got loads and loads of stuff to get through it and i know that you've done tons and tons of these types of things in the past but there's, there's a bit of a format um, i think you listened to the last podcast i did with keith so 
what we do well, is I, we're not to, I listen to, to I listen to the one of Keith and it, I mean Keith's best talker there is. I mean what he don't know is not worth knowing and, yeah. um, and and what before we get started, I'll tell you what come from that is um I listened to it and it was quite interesting talking about um what he's doing with the charities now. Is it is it mm. Sarah Collins? That's right, yeah. Um, they're doing lots of things and I know we're struggling to get hold of tattle and bait. And I rang Dave Preston up at uh, Fulker Bates and uh, he's going to send him as much bait as they want for all, all the trips. So, yeah. you know, that, that your podcast is actually going to help some kids and, you know, people that uh, that, that need the tackle. So, yeah. just listening to that, it's got, it's got Keith in a, in a good position. So, he's going to get Fulker Bates for kids and for people that, you know, for, to, to help them in them sort of situations. So, well, so, so, it's, so, it's worth doing for that reason alone. Yeah, no, exactly. Just and as I said on the on that episode as well, if there's if there's one kid that sort of comes out of that and has a different view on things, uh, you know, a different perspective on life, then you know it's done its job. So if we can all do our own little bit, absolutely. And, and Keith, yeah. Keith's Keith, Keith awesome at things like that. He's just uh, he's just a legend, and uh, you know, he's, he, you know what he's done for our sport is uh, is second to none. Really, he's a top bloke. It is, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty more episodes with him. That's sure we could have chatted for hours, and and you probably picked up then. We we have a bit of a theme. We we're talking about a past, a present, and a and a future yeah. type setup, I guess. And and there's that much stuff. It was the same with Keith. We could have gone back forever, and there's so many great stories and whatnot. But um, I chose one of two things. When I was I was thinking, well, what can we speak to Tommy about? There's so much to get stuck into. And I thought, where where do we? I thought I thought what I'll do is I'll kick off with. What I remember, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's fair enough, yeah. Because at 89, a bit too early for me, you won the World Championship. I'd only just started fishing, if you like. Um, but moving forward a little bit, there's this one image, and, and I'll throw it at you now, Tom. It was 1995, and it was mm-hmm. splashed all over Angler's Mail, Angling Times, advanced pole fishing at the time and all sorts, and you're in a red T-shirt, a red cap, with embassy all over the front yeah. of it, and you just smashed that five-hour world record in the embassy pairs final, tell me about that because I just remember three big nets full of green. <laughs> it were it were it were incredible incredible. Uh, it was I mean you know the world record. It were it were a big thing at that time. It were a big deal, and uh, you know we we'd had a couple attempts in Ireland and we've been close to it. Me and Dennis, but it were you know lots of anglers actually went to try and break that record. It were a proper big deal. It was before commercials and everything like that. And of course we qualified for embassy. And uh, we, we we had done a couple of times before, but nobody was going to catch three hundred and twenty twenty three pound. I mean, it was you know it was just one ton. That's what you're taught in your head. And uh, and I'll never forget the fact that we went over and you went over on the the, the boat and you, you fished this Skanderberg section. And for two days, all you did was fish it and pre bait it. I didn't catch I didn't catch a fish first day. Not many people did. But you right. tied all your ground bait in, and the second day you caught a few fish. And then hopefully third and fourth day, the fish will be, will be ready for the uh, for, for the competition. And that's just how it works. It would have pattern. You just had to fish. This is why we went early, so we could put, you know, uh, the bait in. And, yeah. uh, anyway, on the, the first morning, uh, uh, I were in the Nessex section, and uh, and I drew 39. And I drew 39, lad come to me and says, you'll break world record today, you. And I went, what? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he says, I, I fished there yesterday, he says it was absolutely black at end. And I took, we just took it as a pinch of salt, really. I mean, we, it, it, all we were bothered about were winning pairs, you know. Oh, else, you know, it never, yeah. it never really entered his head, to be fair. We, you know, we didn't think we were going to catch 320-odd pounds. And uh, anyway, so we had no tackle and no like that, but the tackle that we had was proper strong and aggressive. It was a bit crude, wasn't it, back then, yeah. And when I got to my peg, I was next to M peg. But the end peg was set in the base, so I was really out on my own in this, so like a little point. And uh, I plumbed up, and, and it was about eight foot deep, as I remember it. And I had a six and a seven metre pole. Yeah. And uh, and I could see all these bits coming to the surface, and I'm thinking, what's them like? And of course, it turns out they were obviously breed feeding up bottom. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I mean, there's gear with like eight pound line, six pound up, 12, size 12 up to a, what in them days was a crook. And this crook were, were like, I mean, it's just like, without your number, one section in. So it was really aggressive. But we've been doing this in Ireland for ages, so we knew what the gear were like. And anyway, just went in and I put a dendrobeaner on, went out, chucked a couple of balls of ground bait, 
and as I was chucking a mid float went under and I got a bream. And then I got another one. I got I think it was six or seven in as many casts. And then I stood on the pole and broke it. Oh god. I picked, I picked the smaller one up, went in, and they were even shorter and I, and you know, I just kept catching and catching and I finished up with hundred and seventy and about six roach I think it was. And uh, and everyone was saying, Well that's when you the trouble is well, when you caught these bream the the none of them looked under two pounds. Yeah, but I know from experience the average one pound twelve. I don't know why. From it, whether it was because it were, it, you know, it were early in season fish had just spawned and they won't yeah. fall. I don't know. So I knew it was going to be really close. And uh, anyway, they lifted nets out and weighed them and weighed them. Now the strange thing is we know the weight in pounds, which were I think it was, I don't want to show three twenty one. At six or three twenty three six, I think it was three twenty three six. But the weight is in kilos. Of course, yes. So, yeah. so when it's come to it, they've added all this list of weights up, and Terry Smith times it by two point two, and uh, and it was short. Oh, one pound twelve short. Oh. And, and we're uh, oh, well, not one bream, not one bream. And then and then a lad from uh, oh, I can't I'm terrible with names, by the way. And he says to me, uh, it's 2.2, I think, 048. So with mm. all these lists, of point oh four eight to add up. And Terry Smith from Daily Mirror wrote it down, and he says, you beat it with uh, five ounces, 323.11. And, of course, it worked it out long, and I mean, a lot of these figures. And uh, and I thought, oh, I can't just accept that. And <laughs> I, can, I can honestly say it was the weirdest feeling in my life because... Okay. I sat there thinking, have I brought world record? And, and they all left me to wait other lads in. And they were like, I just sat there on my... <laughs> was you on your own as well? Yeah. On my own. And I'm like, I couldn't pack up. I was checking. They took all these photos and nobody knew if I have officially done it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm still sat on my box with me head in my hand thinking, have I done it? Have I done it? And also the late uh, Roy Truman came running up and he was running up with his arms in the air. Tommy, you've won it, you've won it, you've won it. And I, what are you on about? And he come up to me, jumped all over me and said, you broke it. And, uh, and I broke it, I had broke it, officially broke it with five ounces. And it was a big deal in them days. And yeah, the fact it, it were in the embassy and everything like that just made it worthwhile. It made the, I mean, the trip was just spectacular. But, you know, it could have been broke day after, but strangely enough, it didn't bother me that much because I'd, I'd broke it. done it, yeah. Was there a, was was there a one day? Even if it for one day, I'd actually broke the world, you know, in them days. Because, like I said, it was a big deal. It was like, it were, you know, we used to go to Ireland to try and break it. You know, we, I, I know there were two attempts in Ireland right, when it was 166 when Ian held it, and when it was 209, I think it was. And I had two chances in Ireland and uh, mm. just, just come short. So, you know, it were, you know, it was something that people take took really serious and it was it was incredible and it just made the trip you know the fact that me and Dennis won pairs as well and uh, we brought world record it, it, just, yeah, it, was, it was best trip ever really fantastic I mean, got boat coming on with soup tomato champagne everybody at boat uh, all Ireland were absolutely paralytic <laughs> it was <laughs> it was best, it was best trip ever honestly just incredible I mean for me like it was just the, the fact that I won world record over it was just special and then it, it, it got smashed, I think, a uh, year after. And I think I had it for about 12 months. And uh, and then and then it just went silly with, with commercials. And I don't know what it is now. It's about oh, no pound or something now. I think it's... Well, the, that's the thing. There's no there's no kudos to it now, is there? That's, you know... We'd, no, but in that case, because there were no commercials, it was just, it was just uh, bream fishing and uh, uh, roach fishing and uh, just, just, you know. But it was were, it were just one of them things. It was... Uh, it was just special, and uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you know, like I've just wrote my book, and I left it for the last story because it was that special. I wanted that photo that you that you talked about. It's in my mind, yeah, three. yeah. I wanted it to be the last photo in the book, and yeah. uh, and and that's why I, that's why I left it while it last. And uh, so that photo, we mean that net of bream with the last one, and uh, and it, they were just, uh, you know, I read it somewhere about it, it on Facebook recently. And the embassy trips were just really, really special, and 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 we really missed them. Even to this day, people mm. still have. They used to give you uh, carryalls and things like that. Yeah, they used that's to spoil right. you the the, the the embassy people, 
And uh, I still see him on the bank and people still talk about it. And I'm still sure today, of all the competitions we used to have, that one would definitely work today. I'm absolutely sure of that. Yeah. And Embassy Pairs, that style, would definitely work work today. 100% that, because they were that special. But, the, you know, the biggest problem was the, the fact that tobacco sponsorship mm. went yeah. out of sport, not just fishing. And, right. uh, and, and, and you know, we, we, you know, we had a, a lad called Pete Manzi who was the, the main person from embassy and, and, and him and I think Peter Epson, I think it was. I don't know whether he was still with us, but um, they used to come. And because they were fishermen themselves, yeah. they, they, they made the trip. But the trips were absolutely out of this world. Everybody that went on them trips still talk about them today. They're really well, it's good. funny, you know, Tom, because... I don't know if you're friends or if you follow Billy Knott on, on social media. Yeah, all the time, yeah. Yeah, well, he's having a right old sort of heart back with his memories and his pictures and, and all sorts. And, and I bet he'd be the same as well. He'd be itching to get up. And I know he's retired now and he's got his fishery down down Cornwall yeah. and whatnot. But, you know, some of the, and everybody, the comments, you know, all that era. I say I was only a kid. I don't, I vaguely remember, I just remember that iconic image. And, oh. um, Everybody's harps about it, yeah. They do, but it's, it, I mean, I love uh, with, with Billy Nuss. I love uh, looking at his old stories and his old photos. The great, because I remember yeah. a lot of them, of course, you know, because uh, a lot of them were, uh, you know, uh, I didn't win much money off him with Bucky, but I, I, remember, <laughs> a lot of, I remember a lot of photos. I had him a couple of times, I think, but I think he's got more of my money oh. than I've got his. Well, they do. That's why he's got a nice fishery down there, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Probably got really? it on my money, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh crikey! Well, that, that's a great start. I'm, you know, I'm so glad to talk to you about that because it's just that defining image for me. And I guess thinking of of other sort of situations, scenarios, and I always think about tackle companies. And I know you've been associated with with a number of tackle companies over the years. I mean, quite a long time. With what were Preston like? 14, 15 years. 14 years. Like, I, I, yeah, I, I think I had three years with Tricast. Yeah, I had, uh, thirteen years with Daiwa. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, 14 with Preston and, and uh, I had a couple with uh, with Maver. With Maver, yeah. And yeah. you know what? For me, Tom, weirdly, again, just harping back a little bit, as we do on these these shows, I, I, I think of you and I think of Iowa. And the reason why, even though it's all... Sorry. I think of Iowa. Yeah, because yeah. Even though all the sort of development you did with Preston and all the inventions and tricks and, and you know, don't move your feeder and all the rest of it. Yeah. But with Iowa... Do you know how much those rods go for with your name on even now today? Well, we did. Well, that, I know because people ring me about them, and <laughs> I, know, I know the the connoisseur rods, the, the purple range of connoisseur rods. I know that, in my this is my opinion, that they were the best range of rods ever made. Yeah. They were the best. The purple range of connoisseurs were the best range of rods, and I know Keith Arthur rang me. He did. He said something. it. Yeah. And I know. It, I can't remember what price they were, but he he bought one and he paid the same amount as he did as when the day they came out. Yep, and he, and he name checked those rods last on the last episode as his favourite bit of kit. Without a doubt, the one the, the, the best range of rods ever made. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's been like you know them and the mini range of rods when we were at Preston, because uh, that started all that off. But but that that range of rods were just out of this world, and and uh, and when I when I, because people come up and show me, and they send me photos and everything, and uh, yeah. all the range of rods I've ever been involved with, there's no doubt about it that they were the best. No, no <laughs> doubt about that. It's funny, it really is. Cause I, you know, you look on on some of the eBay and whatnot, and you see the the, the prices of them. They just they're like a they're like a Rolls Royce. You know, they just yeah, hold they the are. value. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's not, it's unbelievable, really. But and I, I I think you could you know you could get them rods. Just probably put different rod rings on there. And, yeah. and I, I think you sold them again. I really do because yeah. of that good. No, hundred percent. Yeah, it's great. I'm, I'm thinking of some other sort of iconic images as well. And there's a there's one I always think about. And, and let's talk a little bit about um, fishing for your country. Um, yeah. the, obviously, the the world championship would have been the the pinnacle of your career. But ju- just tell me what what's it? Because I know you're a big you're a big Englishman. Can't explain it if you if it's time time. But when you were there, I mean, I, I've always said the greatest batch badge is the three lions yeah. you know when you've got that three lions on your shirt there's that song three lions on the shirt and that's <laughs> the star really it's yeah. just it's just the best feeling in the world and you know when you're not part of it it's horrible 
yeah. you know, if you get left out and things like that, you know what lads, what they're doing and everything like that. It's horrible, but it's your country. You know, yeah. when, you, when you go abroad, all these other countries that you're fishing against, they're as proud as punch to have their, you know, to, to, to fish for their country. And, uh, and and it's no different to, you know, I mean, crack had the full brick wall, you know. I yes. said in, I said in uh, I, I did a, a memory thing, and I can remember it when I won it in 89, team from third. And I'd have gladly swapped round and, give, you know, took a bronze individual and give a, a team gold medal and, and been, as, been as happy as, as Larry. Yeah. And, you know, because it's, that's what it's about. It's about representing your country. You can't beat it. And, you know, one of the things I always say to people, you know, people outside our sport don't relate to fishing no. at, at, at the high level. But when you represent your country, it's not like football and England and at cricket and things like that. It's exactly the same. Of course it is. Yeah. The same feeling. And, and I'll tell you now, it doesn't matter what level you fish, or whether it be juniors, whether it be ladies, or whether it be men's, feeder, uh, uh, veterans, it's exactly the same. It's yeah. no different. You, it's the same feeling you're representing your country. It's the best feeling in the world. It's, it, you can't, but you can't buy it. You know, it just you've just you've got to be talented. You've got to be good to get that three lions. And uh, it's you know, it's 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 all I've ever wanted to do from getting my first opportunity. It's all I want. I still is. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, are we going to raise that? Dodgy hip and a bad leg. You don't <laughs> want to put that three lions on. Dead right. Well, are we going to raise that because I know. With with COVID and, and all the rest of it, what's gone on? You, you were sort of on the edge of between being a veteran and a masters, weren't you? So what happened there? Where, where are we now? Because you're at a bit of a funny age, aren't you? I I I, I, I was a funny age. You've no doubt about that. <laughs> um, but I'm 65, I'm 66 in May, and what it is it, it, from 55 to 65, you you're a master, and right. then you move up to veterans 65 up. Now then. It gets more, a bit more complicated because you can fish above 65 in the Masters if, if, but you can't, once you've gone into the vet, you can't go back into the Masters. Got you. Right. So you, basically, you can fish any age until you you, you, you get into the veterans, and then, then you're a veteran then. Um, but of course, the problem is, like, we didn't fish last year, so we lost a year. Yeah. And it doesn't look like we're going to fish this year. Mm. Now, two years. At my age, or our age, I should say, is a big difference. It's yeah. not so bad when you're 30, 40, you think I've still got a few years left. But that's the problem because younger people are coming through and younger people, when I say younger people, I'm talking about, you know, 55, 56 <laughs> yeah. years old. Yeah. Right? Yes. And, and now I'm getting, I'll be 67. Now, management then think you might be too old and, and then you've got to move on to the next category. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. but then there's also a team of lads that are fighting for their place. So it gets difficult. And also now, of course, there's a feeder veterans. There is. Ah, so yeah. which, which is in, uh, which starts in September. Um, so, the, the, you know, so what's happened is in fishing, it's, a, you've got a, you can have a career after your career, you know, you yeah. can, you can have a career, let's say, let's say feeder team or, um, or it float fishing team. And then you get to 55, and you can fish till you're 70. In mm. fact, if you're good enough and you get selected, yeah. the beauty about this sport, the fishing, you can start at 20-odd year old. Get it, get, well, you could start younger, really. You could start at 15 and get in as a junior and work up up to 70-year-old. Which is probably what Will raise and all do, I imagine. Well, well, people like Will Ray, exactly. You know, people like that will just they'll keep fishing for, if they want to. Yeah, fishing for him up to seventy year old. It's a, it's an you know they could fish forty world championships, maybe more. Yeah, you know because it's all worked out that way now that you can just carry on and carry on. It's incredible, really. I'm just gutted. I'm sixty five, and and it, it can't happen to me. <laughs> you know because that's what I'm be aiming to. And, hey, and, pl- plenty of life yet, so I'm not worried about that. But I have actually oh, got yeah. two questions around the whole England thing. And so first, first one, a quick one for you. Um, should fishing be in the Olympics? Oh, that's a good I tell you something, that's a cracking question. And I don't actually know the answer to that because I don't know. I, I think there will be some kind of fishing, but I don't think it will be actually fishing. But but my, my, my argument is this. If you allow golf and other sports into it, then why not fishing? 
Mm-hmm. That's, that, that, that's my that's my argument because the Olympics isn't like for golf and for I don't know some Tennis. sports originally. Yeah. You know the the idea of the Olympics wasn't for them kind of sports. But if they're allowing sports like that in, then why not fishing? I don't think there's out wrong with that personally. So yes, the answer is yes, but it'll never happen. No, I, I agree with you, and I think if it was, if it does get accepted, I think it'll be more. I don't think it'll actually be catching fish. Weirdly enough, no, I it'll think be, it'll, it'll be casting. Casting, it'll be like, yeah. It'll be like yeah. a casting tournament, or or maybe even fly fishing, something like that. But yeah. It'll be something like that. Technical. Uh, yes, correct. Yeah, I think it'll yeah. be something like that. But you know, if they allow golf in it and. There were two other sports I saw accepted recently. Can't remember what the one I went really. Yeah. What they've got to do with Olympics, and that were my that were my first thoughts. And that's, and if they're allowing things like that in, I don't know why they shouldn't allow the biggest participant sport in the world to to actually take part. I agree. And my second question, I think, sadly, well, it's true. There's, there's no doubt that, and this is why I, I sort of, what does it feel like to fish for him? I think it's been diminished by these big individual competitions so i don't know whether there's anybody that can do the two if that makes sense can you chase all over the uk on qualifiers looking for these big 50 no. grand competitions you're different, you're, and no, fish for england no you're different, you're different people yeah i agree you can you can call it you can qualify for an odd and like i've qualified and will qualify for a couple of not and i'm not qualify because we're good anglers, and occasionally we'll, you know, we'll get a break. But but some of these lads, like who who are chasing the the fisher maver, you know, the maver and everything like that. Yeah. That's what they do. That they spend their life just qualifying for these matches, and they go to every round, and to, you know, and it's a career to them. Yeah, fair play. And fair play to them. I mean, there are some fishermen, you know, your Bennett's and uh, and what they call it from Liverpool, uh, Jamie Hughes, Jamie. yeah. They're incredible when you watch yeah. them. They're just, you know, they're absolutely outstanding. But they've never been all good with an English shirt on because it's a different criteria. It's a different mentality. It's a different way of fishing. And you know, you, you, you know, these lads that fish for England dedicate their lives fishing for England. They, they go to the slider venues. They go to the bloodworm venues. They go abroad. They take the internationals on. It's a different criteria completely. In my opinion, I think that that people have got the big money, the big prizes in the eyes, that, that that's got more kudos than fishing for England. And I personally think that's crazy, but would you agree with that? Do you think that the fish shows and all that have got a bit of bigger stature now than fishing for your country? Um, well, well, it shouldn't have. It should never never be the same league as representing your country. But, it, but, it, but you're quite right. I agree with you with, to a certain extent. And I think, but I think that's down to a lot down to how it's publicised, how it's pressed. Because there's more people go commercial fishing, mm. you know, they, they, follow, they follow that. But I still think people are interested in, in uh, fishing for England. For example, I think if there were world championships in England, I think you'd be gobsmacked how many people would turn up and watch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that... I think because they can't relate to it, and I think that's why the feeder world championships it gets a lot of press because the average angler can relate to it better than the can the float fishing world championship. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because we don't, because when you go abroad, when you go into Europe and places like that, every match you fish is to international rules. Mm-hmm. But we don't, we have his own set of rules. And that's why the most anglers can't relate to it. They want England to win and they'll always want that. But they can't relate to this the the international rules that they all fish to abroad. I mean, every time I've been abroad, I've never fished a match that's not to international rules. Yeah. And but over here, apart from an odd match, I've never fished one that has international rules unless we've actually organised it. Organised it, that's right. Yeah. Do you think so, that that's an angling trust thing? Should they be pushing those types of events more, maybe? No, because I don't think it worked now. I think it's too late. Right. I think it's too late for that now. I think... They've gone down the track of uh, promoting commercials for fish show and big matches like that, and I think, uh, and I think, the, the, and that's the right thing to do. I think from their point of view, because most fishing is with commercials, whether we, you know, whether people agree with it or not. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever way you look at it, 
it's for that's what it is. It's uh, and they've gone down that road. But you know, I think I wish there were more. I wish there were more press. Um, I, I can see my own opinion. I don't. I think we need somebody at the Angling Trust who who is press related for all the matches. Mm. Uh, and so, so they could promote him. I think like, like a PR like, manager for just for match like, fishing. I agree. Like yeah. I, when I was when I was manager, I did eight years with ladies. I did eight years with feeder. So I did sixteen years, and I can't think of one representative from the Angling Trust that came on their matches. Right. No. Yeah. Right. Um, from a you know to promote it to pro- so we had to do it ourselves, mm. and and I think that's what's wrong. You know. I think with the, with the new management in place at the trust as well, it's it's obviously being um, brought, you know modernised if you like. So yeah, no, no, and it's and it's looking good, and I think it's right. But my, my point is that I think there should be someone appointed to go on every world championships to promote the team, mm-hmm. right? To promote the team, if you because we've got to get sponsors. How, yeah. how can you expect? The body to expect sponsors to come in. If you're not promoting them, yeah, if you're no, not promoting totally. the events, yeah, you know, I, I mean, you know, when our when our when feeder uh, manager, I was very lucky because I got on with Steve Fitzpatrick, and he said used to send Lloyd over uh, uh, all time for us, and uh, we, you know, we we looked after him and everything, and they, they were brilliant with us, and that's why we got sponsored. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but you need that on every well, everyone, juniors, ladies, and it's somebody's job to actually do that. And that's the yeah. only way they're going to get sponsorship and uh, by promoting the events. It's all about PR, isn't it? Yeah, it's all it's about, like it's all about any about. other business. It's about you know, marketing is king, we had, absolutely. You know, we, when, when we were over there, uh, Preston sponsored the, the Feeder World Championships, and what happened was uh, uh, they used to send Frankie over. Thank you, Jam and Jelly. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yes. And, and he used to come over, he used to interview all lads, talk to lads. He did, he did see his Facebook he Live and most of us. Everybody yeah. over here knew what was going on. That's right. Thank you. We're awesome. He was an absolute gem. And the fact that he understood fishing yeah. helped it. So it helped us. Yeah. And then, of course, it, it, it could relate back. And, and it, 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 did, it did us, it did the team massive, it did Preston massive. And of course, he did himself a lot of good, and because he did an awesome job. But you know, mm. Preston, Pre- Preston shouldn't have to send somebody over. It should have come. In my, it's only my opinion from the trust. Yeah. So, and that should happen on every world championships. And that's the only way you're going to get world championships revived in, in this country is if you promote them. And they're not getting promoted right, in, in my opinion. No, I, I'm with you. I get it. And, and have two other parts, I think, with the the international. So we'll we'll touch upon the the feed. Of, well, they run hand in hand in my mind as well. So I, what we've seen, I think, over the last twenty years is a, is an evolution of of, of international fishing. Uh, on the float fishing side of things, we've seen the Eastern Europeans yeah. um, absolutely boom with their. You know, you think back twenty years ago, you 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 would have laughed them off the bank with some of the kit that they had. Um, yeah. You know, didn't have a clue. It was always, it was, it's like a wine, <laughs> you know, your old vintage yeah. wines, your Italians, your Spanish and your French were the, were the main ones. Well, now these are like your new world wines, your South yeah. Africans, your Hungarians, your Polish. Uh, and we've seen the evolution of that. And what we've also seen is an evolution with, and I believe partly down to yourself, is because of the, what we've seen is the boom in feeder fishing, yeah. which has took the UK scene a bit of a, a, a roundabout turn that, yes, commercials are, are, are the bread and butter and let's not you know beat around the bush if it weren't for commercials it would be in the doo-doo but what we've seen is is now people because of the success of your feeder teams and now with dean and um and a, and a sort of a we've had to press on on the float fishing side of things we've had to up our game because you've got people snapping away at your eels from yeah. the other side of europe i mean when like feeder fishing when we first took them you know when we first went you know that a lot of them couldn't couldn't cast out, but what you've got to remember is these anglers are the top anglers in their countries. Yeah. So when you are a top angler, you understand and you want to learn and want to get better, and and that's what you have to do. So what happened was a lot of them to start with were a bit like myself that they've been in the float team. Yeah. 
So they've been in their country float team, realised that they were probably uh, maybe, I don't know, past it that youngers have come through and they thought they could get back in with a feeder team. A bit like myself, you know, and you thought you could get back in with feeder. And that's how it all started. And all of a sudden, all these youngers have thought, well, I like that, I can, uh, I can fish for my country. Yeah. And, uh, and, that's, and that's how it started. But never forget this, the fantastic fishermen and the continentals, they know more about ground baits than us. They know more about flavourings yeah. and they know more about things like that. And what I used to say to our feeder lads is we've got to, we've got to beat them out of skill and knowledge because if it comes to colourings and flavourings, they'll beat us. Because they're not afraid or experimenting. And that's what's happened. And mm. they've just got better and better. They've learnt how to cast. They've learnt how to about understanding about the feeder. And they're just awesome at it. But what that's got to do it's got to make our lads better. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and, and, you know, it don't matter what level you're at, you've got to push yourself and make yourself better like they've done with us because they want to win. And, you know, I see some of them now, some of these continentals, and I go, wow. Yeah. I mean, some of these, one or two Italians, and these German lads, they're just awesome. Yeah. These, you know, some of these German anglers are fantastic. They really are. And, the, you know, the, the Hungarians are coming on strong now. They do it a bit different. They do it a bit finer, a bit lighter. Um, but, wow, they're, they're, they're fantastic. But, they've, but got to remember, the brilliant anglers, the top of, in their country, and the one, you know, they want to win, they want to compete, just like they did with Flo, and they've worked at it. And, and I can see, a, you know, a, a big difference in the next few years. On the flip side to that, though, as well, I guess with the boom of commercials here over the last sort of 30 years, that switched us around a bit where we're now a lot better at big fish. Um, in the past, perhaps, you know, would, yeah. have, would have been great on silvers, bream, specifically, you know, roach, etc. But now we can go to the likes of, I'm thinking, Spain, South Africa, where you're going yeah. direct with cat, catfish, and, and that's benefited us. Uh, uh, no, no, 100% that. that. We've got a great combination. Now, don't get me wrong. As anglers go, we've got the best anglers. The float team has got the best anglers. The feeder team have got the best anglers. We've got the best fishers. The, lay, the lasses are saying they've got the best anglers. But it's it, when you go abroad, you, you, you're battling against two things. And the most important thing is the climate. Mm. You, you know, you, you, they under, the anglers, when you go abroad, understand how fish feed in 35 degrees temperature. Yeah. Right? We don't. You know, because we don't get it. No, you know, we, we, we mug them or we slap a pellet. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the, the war, what happens over here, the warmer it is, the come to the top. But when you go abroad in them temperatures, the warmer it is, the you only go to the bottom because it's cooler. Mm, so yeah. you have to you have to learn different skills, and uh, and that's that's what you have to do. We've got the best anglers, and, and trust me, if we get the method, you can't beat us. Yeah. If if, England, if one of the England teams gets them on the method, you'll they'll never be beat because of the best anglers. Right. When when you are when when you first get picked, like I got I, I fished um, when I was, and I didn't want to do all else then, yeah. Because it's addictive. You, it's, you, it's like it's so addictive. When you like, I mean, I got dropped a few times. Dick kept dropping me, and and uh, troubles he kept winning when he dropped me. So, it, <laughs> so oh, yeah. and uh, but it was horrible. It was horrible. Sat on settee. So of course, when I'm a manager, I. I I could push the lads and say, don't do what I did, because I'll tell you now, when you're sat on that settee and they're all abroad, it hurts like hell. Mm. Yeah. It really, really, so work your nuts off, work hard, and keep yourself in that team. Because if if, shirt, if you get shirt taken off you, it's hard to get it back, and I'll tell you now, it, in our, it doesn't half hurt you. It's yeah. horrible, honestly. It really is. Uh, yeah, no, totally. Well, I guess my final, before we, we sort of talk a little bit about the here and now and, and, and future plans for Tommy, um, final question on England. No holds barred. Uh, best thing at angle you've ever fished for, uh, fished with, sorry, uh, for the England team? The best angler? Yeah. Oh, crikey. The best, listen, the best angler for me it's quite simple. A bloke that's won world championship five times. Yeah. I think he's entitled to the best angler he's ever been. 
right? The, that's Alan Scott's own. Yeah. I think he's in. I think he's entitled to that title, right? So I think he's the best best hanger he's ever been. I think he deserves that, right? But you know, the best hanger I have is my mate Dennis White. I mean, but I've got to take that out of the equation here because I'm, he, he, you know, he's, he's my best mate and he's his best hanger I've ever been. The most influential angler is Kevin Ashurst. Ah, right. And we he were our leader at team, and we always looked up to Kevin. And uh, you know, he, he was, you know, with Dick and him, you know, they put you in your place. They, you know, they said it as it were, and 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 you didn't argue. You just you just did it. Yeah. So you know, Kevin was the best influential angler uh, that uh, that we've ever seen. You know, and there were a, if, at that time in the in the sort of late seventies, early eighties, if you would have asked any angler in that team, without question, they'd have just gone to Kevin. Every mm. angler, every angler would have said the same person, which says it all. Really, when you consider Bob Nord, you know Dave Roper, Ian Eats, Ivan, people like that, every single person to him, I would have said Kevin. Brilliant. It was, no, that's, it, that's you know, it was just brilliant at it. So we've got, we, we've got him, and we've got, to, we've got to, to Richard, and <laughs> it was just, it was just, it were great times. It really was. Yeah. No, unbelievable. Yeah, I love, I love it. I love um, talking about it. All right, so let's, um, let's move on to, I guess, a bit more modern, really. That, that, that ninety-five story, the, the five-hour one, was the one that I just, you know, I had to talk about. Yeah. That. Fantastic. Uh, but more modern times. So we said about, you know, all the time, at good old stretch there with Preston. So you obviously, I know that you and Dave Preston must get out on like house on fire because yeah. Dave's obviously now the man behind Fuca. Yeah. Um, I, I think you, it's pretty much on record that you said, you know, as soon as you said you want to get involved, you had to play with the baits. You have a very honest relationship. It was like, right, yeah, where do I sign? Sort of thing. Let's get cracking. So yeah. t- tell me about Fuca now. Then I mean, it's getting a real good name for itself. Yeah, and, it is. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's picking up big time now, isn't it? Well, what, I, what happened? Well, David obviously sold, sold the company and, and now moved on, and uh, so but we kept in contact, and you know, we spoke a couple of times of different things. And then just out of blue, he just said to me, he, sent, he rang me up, uh, I've got some bait. Um, will you have a look at it for me? I went, yeah, of course I will. And, uh, and he said, I'll send it, let, let me know what you think. And and I went, uh, so why have you rang me? And he says, because you'll tell me it's true. Yeah. <laughs> he says, you, you won't give me any rubbish, you'll just tell me as it is, if it's rubbish or it's dr- brilliant. So anyway, he sent me this bait up and I looked at it and I thought, oh, that's a bit different, a bit weird. I mean, this was 12 months before it come out. Of course. And uh, anyway, I went fishing with it, and uh, and asked brother-in-law, they they purchased to come with me, from a from from a you know a, a club angler's point of view. I always yeah. try and get somebody involved that side as well. And we went to a place called Bank End because we're allowed to fish with it, and we caught some F ones and a few carp. So we caught fish on it. Because one of my things is about baits is they're only any good. All these fancy baits, colours, flavours. They're only any good if you catch fish. Of course, yeah. Right, because that's what it's all about. So, but we caught some fish, and uh, and I rang him up, told him, reported back, and everything like. That. Then it went a bit quiet, and uh, and and David used to go out. You know, David purchased. He used to go out all the time with him and, and fish with him. We, in fact, I had somebody come to the supermarket once and collared me and asked me for some of this secret bait that <laughs> David was using at, at Bank End because not they could catch for him. And then um, I won't, and I won't, I won't give him any, and, and and eventually gone through that much. I had to go to the van and give, and give him a packet of, of, of this two in one bait. Yeah. And uh, anyway, and all of a sudden it come out, and uh, it started selling a bit, and uh, and then uh, and then one day he says, uh, "Will you do a bit of a feature for me?" Oh well, yeah, mm-hmm. of course I will. And uh, we went up to Lindholm and did a bit of feature, and, uh, and then he rang me up and said, "Look, I've really brought you up here because I want you to to sign up." And uh, and I went right, okay, brilliant. That's uh, and we, and just we just sorted, you know, deal out, and uh, and it wasn't really all to sort out, really. And he says, do you want a contract? I says, no deal. He went, no. <laughs> and we just took hands, and when he's had enough of me, he'll tell me he's had yeah. enough of me, and that be it. And, Old school, yeah. And we'll always remain friends, you know, whatever happens. But it's actually gone really well, and and the fact that it catches fish and. It's easy to use. You just mm-hmm. 
you know, the 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 the, the person who'd never been fishing can take a bag, throw it in water, and put one on the hook from the water. And and there's, there's no other pellets you can do that. And yeah. uh, and it's worked really well. And and we're just expanding to range now. But we just get on. And we did before. We just, we've all just clicked. And uh, you know. And but what is what is done this time is really cute because he's got he's got a, a really good backup team from from promoting his his, his wife Carolyn. You still um, you still work for a big company in London, and, and uh, to be honest with you, her and uh, another lady called Emma, uh, who, who doing all the promotions and all the things. They're unbelievable. They're absolutely outstanding. Uh, to be honest, we're really impressive. To be honest with you, mm. and uh, and you can see from from the videos and everything that we're doing. Yeah, uh, you know, very well put together. Yeah. And it's and now we've got it in different countries, and and it'll it'll be, you know, it, there's no doubt about it that it's going to be an awesome brand. There's no doubt about that, and I know he's exp- planning expanding already and doing. But he's still very passionate then about his fishing. I mean, it could have easily sort of, you know, after Preston put fishing, the tape no. up and the end of it. Yeah, exactly. It's... Oh no, when we when we go out and we go um, go go out doing some videos and everything like that, he. he you know, he, he sits other, other late just fishing all day. You can't get him off box and fishing. <laughs> no, he's obsessed with fishing. He's, he's absolutely fishing nuts, and uh, he's just he's just he's just passionate, just obsessed with it. It just turns. Well, up that's, his... that's good because maybe not a lot of people think that about a tackle owner. They might have thought, oh, you know, they just sit back and watch the money roll in or whatever, and have that sort of perspective. Well, actually, no, you, they're out themselves, you know, trying the bait, and he wouldn't bring a concept to market if he didn't believe in it himself. So. And the it thing is about David. the thing is about David, it, the people that he has on board, he, he wants he wants you to tell him. For example, when it, when when we when he started so because he started sold the baits off as well. Yeah. We had a product called Skins, and we couldn't catch on Skins to start skins, with. Skins, that couldn't ring a bell. He couldn't get his head around it, so I took him and showed him why we can't catch him, and then he changed everything. Right. So, so, so he's not just saying it will work. He, he wants to know. That it's going to work, and, and yeah. he wants to, you know, and, and if you go out with him and prove it, and he, if you've got an idea, he'll listen to it, and uh, he'll always make his mind up, which is the right thing that he should be doing. But it's it's really off. But, but it's it's quite, to be honest with you, it's really exciting. I'll be honest with you because it's, you know, I'm watching a I'm in part of a brand. Yeah, that is, is going to be, going to be, it's going to be, well, it's going to be massive. Trust me, it's going to be massive. It's going to, you know, because we've got other plans happening as well, and. It's just going to expand at range, and what he's sold already is quite staggering, really, for one product. It's unbelievable. Well, what's uh, your um, your thoughts on what what I spoke about on the last podcast when I had a couple of conversations with fisheries and this is this all because what it was, Tom. I, I bought a couple of bags as well. I thought I'd give these a go, and I took them to a fishery near me, um, not far away, on a winter league, and I was just about to put some through the pot, and I thought to myself, Oh, hold on a minute, it's fishery only pellets here. Yeah, I don't know what to do. So. From then on, I asked a few questions. I spoke to Aaron up at Lindholm. He said, no, yeah. they're, they're a pellet form. You can't feed them. He put them on the hook, no problem. And yeah. then I spoke to another one down at Docklow Pools, and he said the same. I thought, well, are they a pellet or are they a feeder? What, what's the description and how does it come across the fish? <laughs> what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it, well it's a good brass. My honest opinion is I don't know. But yeah. if, if you, as an outside power fishery owner, I think they'd be pellets. Um, yeah. you know, and I think you're going to have to class them as, as that kind of thing. But of course, that that's always going to be the problem. And uh, I don't know if you notice that a lot of our DVDs are done on places where we not we can't use fishery pellets. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because we can't feed them, so so there's no point, which is a shame, really, because uh, you know because they're a good product, they catch fish, but we can't use them on lots of fisheries. But that's fair enough, like that's. You know, it's same as any other, um, you know, pellet that's bagged up in in their own brand. I guess is where the, you know, if it's fishery pellets only, they're the rules. No, that's but, fair enough. It's their, yeah. their fishery; they can do what they want. It's what it is. If it was my fishery, I'd be doing what I wanted. You know, yeah. Uh, well, but that's, that's the way it is, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a shame because like we've got these micro ones out now, and crikey, when you mix the mi- these micros in with, you know, like two mils, like on a, mm. uh, 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 an hybrid feeder. Yeah. Oh, unbelievable! But when we go on places where it's not allowed, and we put the, the the hybrid on, and we put like normal two mil pellets on, and then when the sprinkling of the new micro hooker yeah. ones, two in one, 
side will believe different. You, you can see him in the throats. The throat, the spew them up. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, it's unbelievable. Well, I've just bought some um, some black ones, and we thinking it's for uh, for him. Yeah, no, for, that's on the river. Well, to be honest with you, when when we first come out with these black ones, the idea was for the, for the Bible anglers. You know, ah. they put all these on the river, and they put all these um, all the hemp through, and we yeah. straight away went put black folka baits on these, you know, like hemp. Yeah. And and, that's, and 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 of course, that's going to be really interesting to see what the reports. But well, we've had good reports from the anglers who work for us, but of course, it's got to it's got to work with the with the other anglers. Yeah, so, it's going to work so, yeah, so, it's, so it's really interesting, and the fact that you can do different colours, and you can still play it, flavour if you want differently. And uh, we, you know, we've got in spring, we've got a couple of new ideas coming out as well. So watch this space for them. There's the, the only one thing about baits is that they have to catch fish. Yeah, and that's that, that's the most important thing. If they catch, because I, I know lots of baits that don't catch fish. Yeah, they that's look, right. They look fantastic. They look great, but they don't catch fish. And I spend half my life I'll be honest with you uh, trying to work out <coughs> excuse me a bait that's right flavours I mean I've mm. worked I, I mean I've tried all sorts of catch because I know if I get the magic formula I'm going to it's going to be perfect but finding the fa- magic formula yeah. is very very difficult and I spent it I spent oh, I don't know how long it just that's all you seem to do because it's that many oh, it's, it's staggering yeah. I mean I, I want well, I mean, what I do when I go to these shop days, I spend half my life going around flavouring things and, and, and uh, you know, and having, and having a smell. I'm, like, I'm just <laughs> like anybody else, set lids off, have a smell and see what yeah. they like and see if they catch me first before I try them up fish. And well, it's that's amazing. a long, long, long time ago, Roy Marlowe told me that as well. He said, you know, a lot of these baits, they're made to catch the angler before the fish and you, you've got to be careful. You've got, he, he always said, if you find something that catches your fish that you've just said as well, then stick with it. hundred percent. Well, it was Roy, really, that started the first lot. He started with, I can remember, the when I, I started the National Angling Exhibition at Doncaster. Mm-hmm. And, and in 1990... The, the day we're at a table, and this is 1990, yeah. and the, I was sponsored by that. They won't even tell me what were on it until the morning. <laughs> I, I didn't know myself. And on the morning, it was a new range of ground baits. Yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And uh, and there were fish meal. Uh. And it didn't take off. It didn't work because nobody got fish meal. And yeah. that was right, that. He, he started that. And it was like, why would you? you know, everybody was like, what's this stuff? And it was like 10 years before, maybe more, 15 years before its time. And this was 1990. Yeah. It didn't work because nobody got it. Nobody got the fish meal thing because there were no commercials in them days. That's right. They were only just tacking off, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. And, and so Daiwa brought the first ones out in 1990. I mean, the, the, they did this range of ground base. I, I didn't know not about it. Oh, well, <laughs> champions. Top secret. I didn't even know not, not about it. Right. <laughs> There you go, Cracky. Well, I've a massive, um, you know, good luck with the whole Fuca thing. We'll, we'll obviously keep watching um, how it progresses and how it goes. And, and I'll let you know how I get on with me, my black ones on the river because I can't wait to get back to the river when they yeah, find no, out. No, no, they work, trust me. I'm, I'm sure they will, 100%. Well, I guess nowadays then with, with your Fuca piece, and tell us a little bit, um, I suppose, about your book because, I, yeah. I mean, you could say, you could, you know, how many times do we say, oh, you, you should write a book? You could write a book about it, etc. Yeah. Well, you have. So, yeah. did you have a ghostwriter? So how did it come about? Well, it, it came about because I've been on about it a few years now. I've never got time. I'm not a writer. And then on the first lockdown, on the yeah. first day, we got 12 weeks where we couldn't do all. And it were, and I were like, well, what am I going to do for 12 weeks? I've just sat where I'm exactly where I'm sat now in my chair at home. And I thought, oh, I want, I've got a piece of A4. And I wrote, mm. right, world champs, blah, blah, blah. And I wrote 30 titles down. And I went, wow, that's, that's I'm quite impressed with myself. And then I, <laughs> day after, I got another piece of paper and I did, I did, I did three stories. And I thought, all oh, right, that's all right. And I kept doing them and doing them. Yeah. But I did them in my sort of lingo. Mm. And, uh, and and I, I knew that I needed a ghostwriter. And I know lots of journalists. And I thought about them all. But this kid called Alan Barnes, Years and years ago, I always thought I'd be good at writing books. So I'd give him a, a ring and ask him if he'd go write it for me and, 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 and you know, make them into readable stories. 
and he, he says, well, I'll have a look at him. So I sent him three or four stories over, and he rang me straight back, and he went, uh, they're no good, these, Tom. I went, right. why? He says, you've wrote them in Yorkshire. <laughs> he, says, he says, there's only y'all that will understand it. You understand it, yeah. <laughs> and I went, well, you better turn them into readable Yorkshire, but don't take me Yorkshire out of it. And Alan's Lancashire, isn't he? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, he's, he's, he's from Lancashire. Like, from but, side, yeah. yeah. So it's what it is. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> anyway, he was like, uh, after, after I sent him six, he, he rang me back and he said, uh, uh, I just want to thank you for asking me to, to write these, will you? He says, because they're fantastic. And I went, all oh, right. And I went, you haven't had best ones yet. And uh, <laughs> anyway, we just clicked and, you know, I, I, I knew Alan anyway. And, he, he finished up, he, he, he did titles, and then, because uh, originally it was going to be called by the Bleaker, which yes. was my nickname. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it were all set up, and my mate Ken Melton, he, he did all, you know, he put it together and everything like that, and he sorted the print, uh, the press people out for me and, and everything like that. And anyway, the first one come through with by Nick Bleaker, all stories are done, Alan, Alan, me and Alan had done them. And uh, anyway, the, the ta- it come through and I thought, it's not right, that. I, I kept looking at this Bionic Bleaker with me with picture up front. And I kept thinking, it's not quite right, that. I, I no. couldn't get my head around it. And I thought, right. And I sent it to Aaron at Lindo. Yeah. And uh, and I says, because uh, he's, he's into things like that. And I went, uh, what do you think? And within a second, he come back, boring. Well, he, he's honest. Anyway, I'll give him that. No, no, yeah. no that's, what, that's what I sent yeah. him it. And I went, right. Right, I got it, and and then I sent it to another friend, uh, uh, Adrian Van der Heever in, in Ireland, and he went, uh, Tom, it's a great photo, but it's it's not a front front book cover, mm. and I went, right, so I got it then. That way, it was done then, right? It was finished. Yeah. So so I sort of went, it won't bear it, but what we're going to call it? Anyway, Adrian sent me this photo. He sent me, but what I didn't realise it. At the time that somebody else had actually took it, it were uh, Frankie had took it, and I didn't know. And uh, but anyway, he sent this photo, and he went, "That's you." Yeah. He says you're in control. He says you're cool, calm, blah blah blah, which is the now front cover. Yeah. And I went, and I didn't get it at all. You know, I didn't, I didn't get it. And I'm like, no, I don't get that. I don't like it. And and I was like, I didn't get it. Anyway, I sent it to Alan. He thought it was great. Sent it to our Emma, who you know who did lots of work at things. She, they all got it, but me. Yeah. Anyway, so so I got off the backside and I went into town, and uh, I went to all bookshops, and I looked at all books and all titles of, of everything, yeah. Yeah. and I got it, and that's when I got it. I realised that it's, it's the impact of a book is is the front cover, yeah. and and I, and I finally I got it, and uh, and I come home and thought right, what am I going to what, what am I going to call it, and because uh, it can't be Barnet Bleaker. And when I was a kid, they all called me born winner. It were, you know, it's a, where I come from. They'll say, you're a born winner, you young man. You know, like <laughs> that. And I, so I was going to call it that. And then I, I went, oh, born to win. Because yeah. all my life, all I've wanted to do is win. I teach people to win. Yeah. And one or two people might think it's a bit big-headed or whatever. But it's a book. And I needed an impact on the front cover, like like the, the books in the book things. And that's how it come about, really. And it was... And it was a big learning process all, all the way through. I can and, imagine, yeah. No, no, I'll be honest with you. I'm glad I did it. If I could do it again, I'd do it a bit different. I'd do it a different way. But, you know, with that's with hindsight, you know. Yeah. Um, it's quite easy. But uh, but the way it's come across, <laughs> honestly, but it would never have happened without lockdown. No, it no, was, of course. It, and it once it would never have come through without lockdown. And yeah, uh, it's, it's crap and it's sad and everything like that. You know, for for my book, it's uh, it would never have happened, and I'm so glad it has uh, mm. because. And do you know that? Do you know the strange thing is, when I wrote it all, I, there were all I've still got it all the thirty chapters. I throw it down. I says to my kids, I don't care now if it never goes to print. <laughs> so I put it. I put my life, my story yeah. in words, and my kids my grandkids grandkids will see that yeah their kids can see yeah. what the grand what the granddad and great granddad did yeah and uh, i'm right you know i'm right happy it's gone well we're getting great reports back and i'm really chuffed about it to be honest with you brilliant yeah no it's uh it's like a bit of a 
a relief in a release in some respects, and and also a, a great achievement, especially to to get it down and turn it around in in a relatively short space of time. I, I imagine once you got going, you just you know you got cracking and all the members. We have the time, back. you see. Yeah. We, we all have the time. Like like if if if, if it were normal life. It would have took us two years. Yeah, exactly. But because I was sat at home and Ken was sat at home and Alan was sat at home, we got it done. You know, yeah. that's all we have to do. We just we just did it. But if we've got as normal day jobs all day, not so much me, uh, but <laughs> but they they won't have had time to yeah. do it the same. And it would have took us two years. I mean, even at the printers, you know, it were, were like I mean, it was printed in in no time once we got it going. I mean, that's an incredible experience, just going to printers. I mean, unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, unbelievable. But but it was like, so, and that's and that's the story, really. That's how it all worked out. No, I, I, and, you know, I think it's a brilliant thing. And, and one thing as well, Tom, I mean, for, from my side, we've come to the end now, and um, I guess you've always kept yourself relevant. You know, you, I know you mentioned you, you probably think you've, you're, you're ancient, like when you said before about your age and masters <laughs> and, and veteran and all the rest of it. But you, you're always relevant. You know, you still got the sort of the respect of whether it be a young kid who just started the match fishing or someone that's having a crack at maybe doing a bit of feeder fishing and they've only ever used a pole before, or whether it be a new bait that's come out, or whether it's a, a rod yeah. from the 80s and 90s. Your name's still on it. It's still relevant. And and I think that's the the great thing really that's the great story that you can carry on as, as yeah. long as you can really and it's more power to you i think that's as well with, with people that's been around me like in you know in the club days that you know people you know you got to click right here rather than young and you know don't do yeah. like that and like ivan taught me ivan max taught me about how to uh, talk to people you know yeah. you know you'd never forget that you know you're just a human being and uh, you know just because you can catch a fuel field fish you know, I haven't always used to say so. I'm just a normal bloke that caught a few fish. And, uh, but, <laughs> That's a lovely you know, saying, that, yeah. It is, yeah. But, you know, you were always approachable, and I learned a lot of five regarding that. But, you know, I've been with Dennis, and, you know, you know, me and Dennis, when we used to go fish, people don't know this, but when we go fishing, and there were some kids fishing, we'd be there with him, yeah. you know. And if we were playing football, we'd play football with him. <laughs> no, no, no. We'd turn up for a match and there'd be a group of kids playing football and we'd, we'd jump on and have a game with him. You know, or if there's somebody fishing, now they're young, what they got there? No, that's wrong stuff. I need some of these. You know, because, you know, we come from mining villages with normal yeah. people, you know. Rooted. Rooted background, that's the thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Good man. Okay, well, Tom, and, and uh, just before we, we sort of wrap up, a massive sort of thank you for your time. I know you, you, you probably get asked a lot to do these sort of things. It's uh, It's been a big pleasure for me. Um, but I've got six fire questions that you're going to answer as quick as you can. Okay, you ready for these? Okay. You've got two pints of maggots, a packet of hooks, a rod and line. Where do you go and what do you want to catch? Um, you just go anywhere. It don't matter. It's just fishing. <laughs> it's just fishing. It don't make no difference. Just go just go fishing. It don't matter whether you've got local canal, local pond. It don't matter, does it? Just go fishing. That's, how we, that's how we all started. Favourite place to fish? Favourite venue? Oh, my favourite venue. Oh, crikey. I haven't really got one. I've never I've never had a favourite venue. Um, I would have to say, I ain't got one. <laughs> okay, next. Favourite fish species? Days. Dace, that's I've a surprise. Loved, I've always loved catching dace. And I love it, that. That's a great it, answer. Yeah, a reason for it, you don't know whether you're going to get a bite at the top of your peg or bottom of your peg from surface to bottom. And, and they were, I, I always love catching dace. I love that. No one would have expected that answer, I'm pretty sure. Okay, next one. One bit of tackle you couldn't do without. Leave your pee on, Bo. It's what this does. If you put shot on and you want yeah. to take shot or stops off your line, you put a, this thing either side, and you press it, and it takes the shot off. I'll be getting one of them. No, but the, the, trust me, yeah. they're the best six, seven quid, or whatever they are now, you will ever spend. Wow, you, that's right. That's on the list. I'll be listening back to this and, buy, and getting one. Uh, next I'll one. Leave your piombo. I, I know the answer to this next question. Just be a really quick one. You enter a pair as much. Who's your partner? Oh, well, Dennis or Emma. I, I was gonna. I would have thought you said Dennis, but either or, I get it. Absolutely. No, but, 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 but obviously De Dennis. I mean, I mean, you know, I would ask the question: uh, Who's your Ryder Cup partner? 
And I went, oh, Dennis, I'd just be waving to crowd me and just he just bash him into smithereens on his own. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, last one, and here's the toughest one, and you can have as long as you want to answer this. What is, in your mind, your best angling achievement? Oh, man, uh, second day World Championships, 1989. Uh, I come second in reception. That's my best. That's my best day's fishing, my best my best fishing performance. Should never have caught six kilos of fish where I did and I did. And that's my best ever my best ever fishing day that. And that sealed the gold for you. Brilliant. That, yeah, that sealed the gold. It, it sometimes your name's on things and that with that I mean one I mean there were like fifteen pegs one side and twenty others and one kilo at best and I caught six kilo. Wow. And that that that'll never be beat in my eyes. Well, that's an old conversation for another time. We can walk through that whole World Championships another time, I guess. And we could even talk about some of the, the, the those great big sort of England wins, whether it be the one at on Pier Point or, you know, some of the real sort yeah. of challenging yeah. ones you've seen. We can do all that again another time. But I'm afraid we've come to our sort of time. It's been an absolute pleasure. And no, uh, I thank you very much. much. I love talking about it and I'll talk all night about it as you've probably worked it out. For all your fishing needs, be sure to check out Fishing Evolution. Boasting two floors of branded displays, visit our recently expanded superstore at Hadley Road in Sleaford, where we offer a huge range of tackle from all of the leading course and cart brands, such as Nash, Fox, Corda, Drennan, Preston, Guru, Daiwa, and many, many more. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram, where we share all of the latest news and updates about products available in store. Okay, let's have a look in the tackle shed. And uh, this month, in some of the big magazines, there's some really interesting pieces of kit. And the first one that caught my eye uh, was Match Fishing Magazine, page 66. There is a new range of whips from Colmic. Now, these whips caught my eye because of the the the, the length, the range of, of whips they've put together. So they go from five to 10 meters. Now, traditionally, I think about whip fishing, it tends to be sort of three to five meters, mainly to hand. Um, so these are a little bit sort of unique, I guess, in some respects. And, and I guess that makes sense with Colmic being such a big um, Italian manufacturer. And that's a way of fishing on those uh, those waters over there it will absolutely fit into the UK side of things as well. But it's not really a style of fishing you see many people do here. Um, and I wonder why. And I'd love your feedback on this, just to sort of give me an idea as to, uh, have you tried it before? Is it a technique that you doesn't interest you? Or Because for me, it's one of the fastest ways of putting together, certainly a net of silverfish, but actually it's great fun depending on the whip that you buy. Um, you can fish for all sorts. My whip that I've got, I've got elastic strung through a couple of the top kits and I can land double figure carp on my whip. And and that's the, the case, you know, um, depending on and all manufacturers now have, have, have got together a, a range of whips that are pretty affordable or as expensive as you want it to be as well. So uh, the whip fishing, definitely uh, worth a go, whether it be using elastic or a flick tip or, or whatever. They're very, very versatile pieces of kit. So that was on page um, 66. Moving on to page 70, and I had to have a bit of a cheeky wry smile to myself because on episode one of, uh, of our podcast, I spoke about a new rod that I took a gamble on. It was from Leader, uh, less than £40. I thought, Ooh, but I was pleasantly surprised. Well, it's even made it into Match Fishing Magazine. So I know a good piece of kit when I see one and, I, you know, when I use one. And it's here, it's the Leader Concept GT Waggler. It's talking about the 13 foot version, exactly the one I bought. And it's got a cracking little review. And there's even a reel that sort of goes with it as well for, for 30 quid. So, um, yeah, I've, I've sort of vindicated myself uh, from that purchase um, because it's even made it into Match Fishing Magazine. Okay, moving on to um, Improve Your Course Fishing Mag. Um, straight in, page 72. So, page 72, I found interesting because. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a bit of a disaster. I was pegging out a match uh, down at Docklow Pools and uh, I went for a bit of a burn and broke my ankle in three places. It was a nightmare. Um, it took me a long time to get back on my feet, if you like. And in the magazine, if I can find it, 
there's an interesting product that could have solved this issue of slippy surfaces. So there's a set of boots called Leon boots. Uh, there's two types, ultralight and a non-slip boots. Now it's these non-slip ones that caught my eye. Um, and I'll quote, it talks about these super lightweight unisex boots constructed from EVA and TRC polymers, uh, keep the weight to a minimum, but also ensures remain uh, durable and supportive. They're suitable for use any time of the year, blah, 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 blah. Temperatures down to minus 30. Available in standard black or green. The non-slip version, which features a unique non-slip sole that will even grip firmly on wooden pegs, which can be notoriously slippy when wet. Um, there's also a discount code in the magazine here in Improve Your Course Fishing where you get 15% off. So for me, and that was something I'll certainly be taking a look at, perhaps not now, but for certainly next winter, um, Things hopefully start warming up now, but yeah, it's not a repeat performance I ever want again with uh, with slipping. So that caught my eye, that's for sure. On the opposite page, page 73, if you're in the market for, for some new clobber. Last month, I spoke about the Heat Light um, Savage Range, uh, Savage gear that I've been wearing. I know a couple of the lads in my club, uh, the Sleaford Legionnaires, are big fans of MIDI clobber. And it's been out of stock for some time now, but they've obviously got a, a new a new stock has come in because the MX800 Pro range is back in stock. And the great thing about this, I guess, is that you've got something for all seasons. So you get a bib and brace, um, a fleece, and also a waterproof jacket. Um, but in that as well, because of the, um, depending on participating stockists, you get a t-shirt, a woolly beanie hat, and a summer cap. So it doesn't matter what time of the year it is, you've got your club assorted, really. And it's got um, an RRP of, of £220. But as it even says in the article, shop around and you'll probably be able to find the set for around 160 And as I say, I know a couple of lads in the in the club use this uh, these outfits and, and they're very, very impressed with it. So uh, if you're in the market for some new clothing, that could be worth a shout. So that's boots and that is a clothing set all covered off. Moving on to um, Angling Times, the bargain hunter section. And I've just been speaking about whips and just to tie that in a bit further, there's a midi white knuckle whip on offer. Um, it was in February the 2nd article and uh, I'll just sort of find this here. So, yeah, the midi white knuckle Thriller V3 pole, eight and a half meter pole, I'll quote, is packed with power, perfect for taking on lumps at your local commercial fishery. It's light and responsive and is rated up to 24 elastic. The pole comes with a ready elasticated tip section, as well as a free spare top two, which is also readily elasticated. Um, so that's the type of uh, whips I was saying before, which you could probably use for silverfish right the way through to sort of, you know, big double figure carp as well. And that should be £160. It's been reduced and it's now £127.99 at realfishing.co.uk. So versatile whips, that's uh, that's my theme for the month. Uh, also in Angley Times, uh, the February the 9th edition, uh, was a trial from uh, tackle editor Mark Sawyer, which caught my eye, and he's trialed various uh, twin top rods. Uh, now, when we talk about twin top rods, we mean that sort of Avon style, where they've got a, 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 like a tip that could be used for trotting a, a, an alloy stick or a stick float or, or a quiver tip, etc. And there's two that stood out for me. He's probably tested around seven or eight different rods here but the two the first one again brings back old memories but uh, it's the masterline john wilson 12 foot barbel quiver rod again i'll quote it says the big brother to the iconic john wilson avon quiver this barbel quiver has an avon style top rated to one and three quarter pound test as well as a quiver tip top that comes with two two and a half and three ounce quivers an extension piece enables us to be fished at 13 foot in faster waters or when targeting heavier fish when more control is needed now that's around £76. So for such a, an iconic rod, I guess, and, and versatile, that's a good price. Um, the negative, it says, is it's not the best looking rod around and can be a little bouncy on the cast. But in general, it's a good all round barber rod with tactical flexibility. But the one that stood out for me, again, another iconic rod. Um, I spoke before about Dave Costa and, and his input went into this range of rods as well. But it's the Gray's Prodigy, the TXL Barbel. Um, now, if this is a little bit more expensive, around £100, 
Um, but the pros, it's a proven barbel rod at a realistic price. And the negative is that it's a slightly steely resilience, um, best suits it to stronger lines and big hooks. So it's a bit of a no-nonsense rod, I guess. It's a um, two-pound test curve model is ideal for big or fast flowing water. There's also a lighter one and three-quarter pound version as well. Now, these types of rods, so this type of fish, I mentioned before I'd been getting on the rivers um, last summer. And, and I guess to talk about a tried and tested piece of kit, um, from myself it links in with this theme I, I thought i'll have a crack at the barbel but i didn't want to spend too much money um so i bought a quorum uh, barbel rod 12 foot one and three quarter pound test curve two piece um 45 pound so i didn't expect much of it at all but you know what I, i've given it some ammo fished in two or three pretty big floods so having to use, you know, leads up to sort of four or five ounce um, and then with your bait in as well, um, just to try and sort of hold bottom. Um, we've had some reasonable fish, chub up to sort of four, four and a half pound, a couple of small barbel, um, plenty of roach fish in a, a sort of a, a maggot feeder. So I've been really impressed with it because whether it be sort of silver fish up to reasonable size fish, the only one big thing, the, sorry, the only one thing I have missed is that big sort of powerful barbel you know, i was always aiming for a double figure fish which eluded me um to really give the tackle a try but from the use i've had so far really impressive uh, there's a new range of them out i think they're slightly more expensive they're about 50 to 55 pound but they've got better graphics they look lovely and they're probably on a better or more modern carbon bill as well so check it out the core and barbel rods if you're in in that sort of uh, style of fishing um, I've certainly been more than impressed over the last sort of seven to eight months. Um, so I would highly recommend them. But that's it from the Tackle Shed. Well, thanks everybody for listening to episode two of Two Packs of Maggots and a Packet of Hooks, the fishing podcast. As I mentioned earlier on, we look forward to welcoming Rob Hughes to the big chat on episode three. Thanks for listening.